We've talked about the charges, we've talked about the rumors, we've talked about the developments. Well, now it is time to talk about the cold, hard evidence in the Sean Diddy Combs criminal case. How strong is it? How will the defense fight against it? This is really, honestly, the most important question we have to ask in this whole case. From a legal point of view, the evidence. Can the prosecution meet their burden? What do they have to prove? What, for racketeering conspiracy? They have to prove that Combs had an agreement with others to further a criminal enterprise that engaged in at least two criminal acts. Although it's listed that Combs and others engaged in bribery, arson, kidnapping, forced labor, sex trafficking. Speaking of sex trafficking, prosecutors will have to prove count two that Combs used force, threats, coercion to engage, to have victim one engage in commercial sex acts. That is the sex trafficking charge. The final count, prosecutors have to prove that Combs transported people for the purposes of commercial sex. This is transportation to engage in prostitution. And more specifically, prosecutors allege that Combs engaged in a campaign of abusing, exploiting, trafficking women for years, that he would use force, that he would force women to engage in freak-offs, elaborate sexual performances with male sex workers, sometimes drugging these people, filming these events without their knowledge, really, really frightening stuff. So the question is, what is the proof of that? What will be presented at a potential May 5th, 2025 trial? We'll see if that trial date sticks. I talked about, about that a lot in previous sidebars. But to talk to me about the evidence, to help me talk about the evidence, I want to bring in fan favorite, Evidence expert Jules Epstein, who is the Edward D. Allbound Professor of Law and Director of Advocacy Programs at Temple University Beasley School of Law. So good to see you again. Really, really great to see you, Jules. Really appreciate you taking the time. It's been a minute. We haven't even had the chance to talk about the Sean Combs case yet. So before we even get into some of the more details of the specific evidence, overall, what do you make of the charges? Uh, what I make of the charges from an evidence perspective is that it's a nightmare situation for him. And what do I mean? If he had only been charged with one thing, like the assault at the elevator that everyone knows about, the government would not be allowed to bring in arson, firearms, a thousand bottles of lube found in his home. But as the charges grow bigger and bigger and bigger, everything becomes, you ready for this word, relevant. Because they're all part of this grand scheme accusation. So just in terms of the volume of available evidence, it grows astronomically when you get a charge like conspiracy or here, corrupt organizations. It's a really, really good point that they have a lot of leeway to introduce this evidence. And by the way, just really quick, from an evidentiary point of view, even though they're saying that this alleged criminal conduct is from 2008 to the present, right? Could they introduce evidence of him, let's say, allegedly assaulting people in the 90s? Would that be relevant to, would they be able to introduce something that old to help prove uh, racketeering? Um, I was curious about that because the reason I ask is so many of his lawsuits that he's facing, and we don't know if those accusers are going to be um, testifying in this trial, but a lot of it concerns conduct from the 90s, the early 2000s. It predates when prosecutors said that the time frame they're looking at. Do you think there's a way that prosecutors could introduce that evidence? So I hate to do this, but give you the qualified maybe as an That's answer. Fine. That's fine. Let, let me tell you why. Normally, we try people for what they're accused of, not for what they did in the past, because what they did in the past is sort of a who you are or who you were, as opposed to did you do this? Okay. So if I'm charged with assault in 2024, no one should hear that I did an assault in 2019, right? The, unless it's the same person or with some link. In a case like this, number one, the government might play it conservatively saying we don't need to because we're going to have so much anyway 
why risk an appellate court saying, hey, you went too far? However, depending on the defense, if the defense says, for example, oh, these weren't coerced sexual encounters, everybody was happy to be involved, then the government might be allowed to bring in someone from 2004 who said, I was in that kind of encounter. It was not consensual. It was coerced. In the law, we call that a non-character purpose. In other words, that that other act, five years ago, eight years ago, 10 years ago, doesn't just show, oh, you're a bad guy in this case, but it actually has a link. It explains motive or plan or intent. So again, you'd have to read, for example, those other lawsuits. If they involved, what is it called? Freak outs, right? Freak offs, yep. Freak offs, forgive me, I'm an old man, okay? Freak offs. Girls, you shouldn't know what a freak off is in general, but that's just a separate. I'm happy to have that be the case. All right, Um, right? If it was similar, at some point a judge might say, I'll let it in, or I'll only let it in if the defense says it wasn't that way. If you think back, okay, infamous trials, Bill Cosby. Bill Cosby was accused of assaulting one woman. The trial judge let in three other women, me too, to say this pattern happened. I'm not saying that's a perfect analogy, but that illustrates how sometimes even old conduct may be deemed admissible. That's a good point. That's a really, really good point. Okay, so now I want to ask you about this, um, search warrants. Now, prosecutors have indicated that they have obtained a lot of evidence that was seized through search warrants. This is of Combs properties in LA and Miami when they were raided uh, back in March. And also what they seized on Combs and his co-conspirators on their person. And I have to imagine that's probably their phones. Talk to me, um, and by the way, just as we say this, in a letter to the court, the prosecution indicated on October 7th, 2024, the government made its first production of discovery, which included among other things, a complete set of search warrants in the case, meaning this was handed over uh, to the defense. So defense counsel is gonna be looking through all these warrants, what was used to obtain this evidence. This I imagine is their first line of attack, attack the search warrants, because right, if you attach the search warrants, maybe a lot of this evidence doesn't come in. How do they do it? So it's hard to do because a search warrant simply has to be based on probable cause, which means a fair probability that evidence of a crime is in location X. So anyone would read what we call the affidavit of probable cause. That's where the law enforcement agent spells out, I am swearing under oath that here are the facts we've gathered that give us the belief that stuff, evidence, and it doesn't have to be criminal stuff. In other words, lube is not criminal, but it's corroborative of these claims. That evidence is in the place we believe it to be. When a defense looks at a search warrant, they first look to say, does it meet that probable probability test? Number two, is the search warrant overbroad? Okay, does it um, ask too much? You know, in other words, if there's probable cause for A, did they say, but we'd like to search for B, C, and D? Even if the warrant is valid on its face, then did you execute it properly? Did you look in places you weren't supposed to look? Did you seize things you had no right to seize? So that's standard in any criminal case from the most insignificant, and I don't want to say anyone's criminal charge is ever insignificant, but minor charge uh, to the most serious. Let's talk about, let's say the search warrants are not, there's no ground to attack, 
evidence is coming in, uh, at least on that front. I want to talk about the digital evidence. And to be clear, as we discuss this evidence, a lot of this, what I'm about to say, comes from the prosecution's letter to the court when it was regarding bail of Sean Combs. He's been denied bail twice. He's fighting it to a higher court. So in this bail letter from when Combs was first arrested, the prosecutors write, the electronic evidence is similarly vast. The government has sought and obtained numerous search warrants for such evidence, in addition to obtaining evidence voluntarily from certain victims and witnesses. Setting aside devices seized in connection with the defendant's arrest, the government has obtained over 90 cell phones, laptops, and cloud storage accounts, as well as over 30 other electronic and storage devices, such as hard drives, thumb drives, cameras, a surveillance system. This electronic data comes from the defendant himself, as well as co-conspirators, victims, and witnesses, and chronicles much of the defendant's criminal activity as it occurs. So Jules, what can we expect from that kind of digital evidence? And we're talking, you know, I think uh, his phones and his iCloud accounts were also sent to the defense as well. So let me dial it back one second. If we're all in a conspiracy, let's say there are five of us, and each of us has their cell phones and computers and cloud accounts seized, I can only complain about the seizure of mine. So he will have no basis to say, oh, you shouldn't have searched co-conspirator two or gotten the phone of co-conspirator three. We call that standing. And he has no standing to say my rights were violated. So the more people who have videos, um, text messages on their devices, there's no constitutional ground for him to say, oh, that should be suppressed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's all going to be about what's on there. Does it pertain to the charges? Does it have extraneous stuff? Like people using cocaine at an event unrelated to any of this, okay? People talking about sex stuff in a totally different context. So every single video or message or whatever is going to be scrutinized by the defense, the prosecution and, and the judge to say, does it link to this case? But I'm imagining that, the, that there are a lot of, how shall we say, video captures of various activities. Um, and, and if I may just do one more thing, assuming the judge says, yeah, this is all pertinent, judge has to make a couple of other decisions. When is so much too much? In other words, it's like piling on in football. And the second is, is some of it too inflammatory that they say, look, we shouldn't let a jury see that. Maybe we'll let the jury see five representative takes, not 500 takes. That, that, that's a great point, because in this letter, they, the government writes, the evidence against the defendant, which would be made public at trial, includes substantial evidence that is highly sensitive and has the potential to significantly and negatively impact the defendant's reputation. For example, dozens of video recordings created by the defendant of freak-offs with victims. So you have to wonder, is a jury going to be seeing these multiple videos of freak-offs? How are they introduced to that evidence? And, and what would the defense be? Would they say, I mean, I, again, if that, that, it feels like that's gonna be a key piece of evidence in this case, how it's gonna be presented, how much of it's gonna be presented and what the defense responds to it, I think is an interesting question as well. So going to the last, what will the defense response be? It's gonna be one of two things. These video captures are only a small portion of an evening, so they don't really capture it fairly, right? Uh, any two minutes of my behavior, right? You might say, oh, look at Jules, until you see the greater context. And then you'd say, oh, it actually looks different. I think much more seriously, and they've already forecast this in some statements in court that have been uh, repeated in the media, is that this was adult consensual behavior. So they look at the tapes, they come on, they go, but, but here's the, and I was just talking about this before, 
that let's say there's drug use. Let's say there's male prostitutes. I mean, for example, male, male sex workers. In the letter, it says victim testimony regarding free troughs is at times corroborated by other witness testimony, communications with the defendant and commercial sex workers, travel records, hotel records, videos of the free troughs, records reflecting or indicating payment. If you ask me right now sitting here, Jules, I think it's going to be very hard for Sean Combs to fight the third charge, transportation to engage in prostitution, that he wasn't bringing in commercial sex workers. So if these freak offs are now visible, we see them or the jury sees them, does he deny that they're sex workers? Does he just say, does he deny those are drugs? Does he admit certain details of it, but says there's no threats here, there's no physical force, no one's being coerced into this. I mean, it feels like there has to be a little bit of admission and a little bit of denial of these freak offs, if they really do have the videos of the freak offs. If they have that and proof people were paid and flown across state lines, and there's a pretty clear federal statute that says, can't do that, then it's either, okay, I'll take the fall on that, right? Or my subordinates were doing that part. I was unaware. I just said, hey, let's have a party tomorrow. Yeah. And I was blissfully unaware. I'm not suggesting that was or wasn't the case, but those are really the only two options. And I, uh, in a criminal case, a lawyer has to really spend time to get the trust of their client. And then at some point have the, and we call it the come to Jesus talk. It's let's sit down and let's do a realistic assessment instead of just, oh, we'll win everything. What can't we win? Why can't we win it? How do we play this accordingly, and I shouldn't even say play like it's a game, but what is our response? Again, I'm not an expert in interstate transportation for commercial sure. sex purposes, sure. right? Um, and whether there is a defense that it's pornographic movie making, which is allowed, I don't know. But the closer you get to, they've got us called on charge X then you have to figure out how you play that. Can you that, stand up at a trial and say, members of the jury, there's no secret. Yeah, We broke the law in this way. But they've gone way beyond that. That's something sometimes what people do. Jules, I apologize for this, but I have to ask you how relevant this piece of evidence is. You talked about it before, but in the bail letter, we all learn that the prosecution says the evidence consists of to show the freak offs happened over a thousand bottles of baby oil and personal lubricant. Now, I'm curious how relevant this is going to be to the case and how important it is because Combs attorney, Mark Agnafilo, said, yeah, he said in a, a, a statement after the arrest, Sean Combs buys in bulk at Costco. Costco actually came out with a statement saying we don't sell this. What value do you think that this evidence has? Because it's been, there's a lot of, this is a, a salacious detail, but how important are the uh, bottles of baby oil and lubricant to this case? So I, I hate to say this, but until we see the freak off films and see if the people are spraying you know, baby oil and lubricant left and right, um, to be relevant, something has to be about this helpful the tiniest bit, a smidgen. It has to have a tendency to prove a fact. This supports the fact, maybe not the baby oil, certainly the lubricant, right? That there was a lot of sex going on. How important that is in the greater scheme, I don't know. Does the government need it? I don't know. Might a smart prosecutor say, why screw around and use that precisely because it's just this lurid detail. Um, I don't know, or hold it in reserve until we hear what the defense is. So lots of options. I will go from what it could be a questionable piece of, piece of evidence to what I think is arguably one of the most important pieces of evidence. And you mentioned it before. The 2016 video of Cassandra Ventura reportedly being beaten by Sean Combs 
It was published by CNN a few months ago. Um, it changed the whole narrative of this case. I think that was, for a lot of people, the first real proof, the first real evidence they had of what the claims were against Sean Combs, that he was violent, that he was abusive. To see that with our own eyes, to see Sean Combs two days later on Instagram and essentially admit that was him, that to me feels like the most important piece of evidence. I'm curious how you think it's going to prove the different claims. And I and also the defense would be, I imagine, and this is something that's been put, put, put forward by Sean Combs' defense attorneys, this was a domestic spat. This is not evidence of sex trafficking or a racketeering. So walk me through what, where you, how that video is going to play into the case and how the defense can fight against it. It's probably going to play into the case depending on whether she will testify and give it context. If she doesn't testify, a judge uh, and no one else from that day says, oh, we're having this crazy thing and the fight was about forced prostitution and that's when she tried. If you have no context, maybe it has no place in the case. If someone, whether it is the victim or someone else who was there, can say, I can tell you the backstory of what this was. This was not a fight over the laundry bill. This was not a fight over who's taking out the trash or who spent $50,000 on something we shouldn't have. This was a fight over what the, the government is alleging. It's really important because it's not just someone saying it happened, it's our seeing it happen in real time. Yeah, yeah. And um, I know the government, excuse me, I know his defense attorneys are saying the government leaked that video and they want an evidentiary hearing to prove that it was leaked by the government, by the Department of Homeland Security who raided the homes. And they're saying it, 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 it by law, right, if they can prove the government actually leaked it, they could potentially get that video suppressed and it doesn't come into the trial, right? So I, I looked into that a little bit when I first saw it. I'm not sure the law is as strong on their side as they say, but I'm not going to say I'm expert on that. If you want to do another show, I'll do some research. Um, regardless of whether it can be suppressed, the government's not supposed to leak things. Um, I'm just not sure that the remedy is a jury doesn't get to see it. We could pick a jury, believe it or not. I know this is shocking to you. Not everyone watches your show and not everyone follows the news. It's a horrible statement. And so there are a lot of people who actually wouldn't have seen it. Um, so it's sort of a no harm, no foul. If you didn't pollute the jury pool, I'm not sure why it gets suppressed. That's fair. That's fair. Um, let me ask you this before I let you go. Uh, I think this case either rises or falls with the testimony of the, the alleged victims, the witnesses, the potential co-conspirators. There's been a lot of talk about whether or not people have taken deals with the government to testify against Sean Combs. And I think it really comes down to a lot of it, this witness testimony. Talk to me about what you're looking for when, you, when we hear the testimony of these alleged victims, when we hear the testimony of these uh, witnesses to this conduct, to the people maybe within Sean Combs' inner circle. How is that going to, how can we expect that to be portrayed at the trial? And how do you think the defense is going to have an opportunity to cross-examine these witnesses. So I want to break it into categories. If there are other, primarily women, who say he beat me, this me, that me, etc., the defense is going to be looking to see, is there any proof of that? Is there any behavior inconsistent with that? Like, oh, you say he beat you in January, in February, you flew to Tahiti with them, not saying both couldn't exist. Um, are they going, they're going to be looking to say, are you someone who brought a civil suit? Do you have a financial motive to say that? For the people who are the alleged co-conspirators, the defense is going to have to figure out, are they motivated by fear of their own prosecution? 
Could this be that indeed the underlings, the, the folks who worked for him, were doing criminal acts and actually shielding him from it? But when you get caught, you have to blame somebody higher up. That would be the defense argument. At the end of the day, each of those will be, those are attacks we can anticipate. The value of them drops disproportionately when the strength of the video evidence goes higher. In other words, if there's stuff on video where he's saying certain things, doing certain things, that proves the co-conspirators' con uh, claims, the fact that they're trying to cut a deal to save themselves is less important. Everybody's guilty, but I'm trying to be helping the government. It helps me. But who cares because it's all on tape? Well, listen, Jules, I mean, this is exactly what we were looking for. We wanted to break down what the evidence could be. We still don't know exactly what it could be, but I think we have a really good sense of it. Jules Epstein, thank you so much for coming on. Really appreciate your terrific insight, as always. Good seeing you. Good seeing you, my friend. Take care.